Hi, what's up YouTube? Today I got chapter 6 of the Red Pyramid for you guys from, or by Rick Riordan. Um, if you haven't seen chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, and 5, so chapter 6 is in here right now, then go ahead and go check those books out, real, or those chapters out real quick, those videos. Um, chapter 3 and 4 are in the same video, so you might need to, you know, try and figure it out. Anyways, uh, let's go ahead and begin, why don't we? It's a really good book so far. I'm kind of, I'm enjoying it. I wouldn't say that I like it more than um, his Percy Jackson series that I'll also be doing another series, the book reading for you guys on. But I, I do enjoy it. Alright, let's begin. And as usual, my voice might start getting dry at the end, so my voice gets crackly or whatever. Yeah. Anyways, and uh, at the end, around 25, 26 minutes, I might start talking or reading a little bit faster. Um, you know, because, well, I only have a 30 minute limit with this uh, camera app on my computer, so let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 6 Breakfast with a Crocodile. How to describe it? Not a nightmare, it was much more real and frightening. As I slept, I felt myself go weightless. I drifted up, turned, and saw my own sleeping form below. I'm dying, I thought. But that wasn't it. Wait, but that wasn't it either. It wasn't a ghost. I had a new shimmering golden form with wings instead of arms. I was some kind of bird. No, Sadie, not a chicken. Will you let me tell a story, please? I knew I wasn't dreaming, because I don't dream in color. I certainly don't dream in all, dream in all five senses. The room smelled faintly of jasmine. I could hear the carbonation bubbles pinging in the can of ginger ale I'd opened on, the, on my nightstand. I could feel a cold wind ruffling through my feathers, and I realized the windows were open. I didn't want to leave, but a strong current pulled me out of the room like a leaf in a storm. The lights of the mansion faded below me. The skyline of New York blurred and disappeared. I shot through the mist and darkness, strange voices whispering all around me. My stomach tingled as it had earlier that night that that night on Almos's barge. Then the mist cleared and I was in a different place. I floated above a barren mountain. Far below, a grid of city lights stretched across the valley floor. Definitely not New York. It was nighttime, but I could tell I was in the desert. The wind was so dry, the skin on my face was like paper. And I know that doesn't make sense, but my face felt like my normal face, as if that part of me hadn't transformed into a bird. Fine, Sadie, call me the Carterhead Chicken. Happy? Below me on a ridge stood two figures. They didn't seem to notice me, and I realized I wasn't glowing anymore. In fact, I was pretty much invisible, floating in the darkness. I couldn't make out the two figures clearly, except to recognize that they weren't human. Staring harder, I could see that one was short, squat, and hairless with slimy skin that glistened in the starlight, like an amphibian standing on its hind legs. The other was tall and scarecrow skinny, with rooster claws instead of feet. I couldn't see his face very well, but it looked red and moist, and, well, let's just say I was glad I couldn't see it better. Where is he? The toady-looking one croaked nervously. Hasn't taken a permanent host yet, the rooster-footed guy chided. He can only appear for a short time. You're sure this is the place? Yes, fool. He'll be here as soon. A fiery form appeared on the ridge. The two creatures fell to the ground, groveling in the dirt, and I prayed like crazy that I really was invisible. My lord, the toad said. Even, the, even in the dark, the newcomer was hard to see. Just the silhouette of a man outlined in flames. What do they call this place? The man asked. And as soon as he spoke, I knew for sure he was the guy who had attacked my dad at the British Museum. All the fear I'd felt at the museum came rushing back, paralyzing me. I remember trying to pick up that stupid rock to throw, but I hadn't been able to do even that. I'd completely failed my dad. My lord, Roosterfoot said, the mountain is called Camelback. The city is called Phoenix. The fiery man laughed, a booming sound like thunder. Phoenix, how appropriate. And the desert's so much like home. All it needs now is to be scoured of life. The desert should be a sterile place, don't you think? 
Oh yes, my lord, the toady agreed. But what of the other four? One is already entombed, the fiery man said. The second is weak. She'll be easily manipulated. That leaves only two, and they will be dealt with soon enough. Or how, the toady asked. The fiery man glowed brighter. You are an inquisitive little tadpole, aren't you? He pointed at the toad, and the poor creature's skin began to steam. No, the toady begged. N no. I could hardly watch. I don't want to describe it, but if you heard what happens when cruel kids pour salt on snails, you'll have a pretty good idea of what happened to the toady. toady. Soon there was nothing left. Roosterfoot took a nervous step back. I couldn't blame him. We will build my temple here, the fiery man said, as if nothing had happened. The, this mountain shall serve as my place of worship. When it is complete, I will summon the greatest storm ever known. I'll cleanse everything. Everything. Yes, my lord, Roosterfoot agreed quickly. And, uh, if I may suggest, my lord, to increase your power. The creature bowed and scraped and moved forward as if he wanted a whisper in the fiery man's ear. Just when I thought Roosterfoot was going to become fried chicken for sure, he said something to the fiery dude that I couldn't make out. And the fiery dude burned brighter. Excellent! If you can do this, you'll be rewarded. If not, I understand, my lord. Go then, the fiery man said. Unleash our forces. Start with the long necks. That should soften them up. Collect the young younglings and bring them to me. I want them alive before they have learnt, before they have time to learn their powers. Do not fail me. No, Lord. Phoenix, the fiery man mused. I like that very much. He swept his hand across the horizon as if he were imagining the city in flames. Soon I will rise from the ashes. It'll be a lovely birthday present. I woke with my heart pounding back in my own body. I felt hot as if the fiery guy were starting to burn me. Then I realized that there was a cap on my chest. Muffin stared at me, her eyes half closed. Meow. How did you get in, I muttered. I sat up, and for a second, I wasn't sure where I was. Some hotel in, the, in another city? I almost called for my dad, and then I remembered. Yesterday. The museum. The sarcophagus. It all crashed down on me so hard I could barely breathe. Stop, I told myself. You don't have time for grief. This is going to sound weird, but the voice in my head almost sounded like a different person. Older and stronger. Either that was a good sign, or I was going crazy. Remember what you saw, the voice said. He's after you. You have to be ready. I shivered. I wanted to believe I'd just had a bad dream, but I knew better. I'd been through too much in the last day to doubt what I'd seen. Somehow, I'd actually left my body while I slept. I'd been to Phoenix, thousands of miles away. The fiery man, the fiery dude was there. I hadn't understood much of what he'd said, but he talked about sending his forces to capture the, lung, the young ones. Gee, wonder who that could be. Muffin jumped off the bed and sniffed at the, at the ivory headrest, looking up at me as if she were trying to tell me something. You can have it, I told her. It's uncomfortable. She buttered her head against it and stared at me accusingly. Whatever, cat. I got up and showered. When I tried to get dressed, I found that my old clothes had disappeared in the night. Everything in the closet was my size, but way different than what I was used to. Baggy, drawstring pants and loose shirts, all plain white linen and robes for cold weather. Kind of what the fellahin, the, pe the peasants in Egypt wear, wasn't exactly my style. Sadie likes to tell me that I don't have a style. She complains that I dress like an old man, button-down shirt, slacks, and dress shoes. Okay, maybe, but here's the thing. My dad had always drilled into my head that I had to dress my best. I remember the first time he explained it to me. I was 10. We were on our way to the airport in Athens. And it was like 112 degrees outside, and I was complaining that I wanted to wear shorts and a t-shirt. Why couldn't I be comfortable? We weren't going anywhere important that day, just traveling. My dad put his hand on my shoulder. Carter, you're getting older. You're an African-American man. People will judge you more harshly, and so you must always look impeccable. That isn't fair, I insisted. Fairness, doesn't, fairness does not mean everyone gets the same, Dad said. Fairness means everyone gets what they need, and the only way to get what you need is to make it happen yourself. Do you understand? <clears throat> I told him I didn't, but still, I did what he asked. 
like caring about Egypt and basketball and music. <clears throat> like traveling with only one suitcase. I dressed the way Dad wanted me to because that is usually right. In fact, I'd never known him to be wrong until the night at the British Museum. Anyway, I put on the linen clothes from the closet. The slipper shoes were comfortable, though. I doubted they'd be much good to run in. The door to Sadie's room was open, but she wasn't there. Thankfully, my bedroom door wasn't locked anymore. Muffin joined me, and we walked downstairs, passing a lot of unoccupied bad bedrooms on the way. The mansion could have easily slept a hundred people, but instead, it felt empty and sad. Down in the great room, Kafu the baboon sat on the sofa with a basketball between his legs and a chunk of strange-looking meat in his hand. It was covered in pink feathers. ESPN was on the television, and Kafu was watching highlights from the games the night before. Hey, I said, though I felt a little weird talking to him. Lakers win? Kafu looked at me and patted his basketball like he wanted a game. Ah, ah. He had a pink feather hanging from his chin, and the sight made my stomach do a slow roll. Um, yeah, I said, we'll play later, okay? I could see Sadie and Amos out on the terrace, eating breakfast by the pool. It should have been freezing out there, but the fire pit was blazing, and neither, and neither Amos nor Sadie looked cold. I headed their way, then hesitated in front of the statue of Thoth. In the daylight, the bird-headed god didn't look quite so scary. Still, I could swear those beady eyes were watching me expectantly. What had the fiery guy said last night? Something about catching us before we learned our powers. It sounded ridiculous, but for a moment I felt the surge of strength, like the night before when I'd opened the front door just by raising my hand. It felt like I could lift anything, even this thirty-foot-tall statue if I wanted to. In a kind of trance, I stepped forward. Muffin meowed impatiently and butted my foot. The feeling dissolved. You're right, I told the cat. Stupid idea. Besides, I could smell breakfast now. French toast, bacon, hot chocolate. And I couldn't blame Muffin for being in a hurry. I followed her out to the terrace. Ah, oh, Carter, almost said. Merry Christmas, my boy. Join us. About time, Sadie grumbled. I've been up for ages. But she held my eyes for a moment like she was thinking the same thing I was. Christmas. We hadn't spent a Christmas together since Mom died. I wondered if Sadie remembered how we used to make God's eye decorations out of yarn and popsicle sticks. Almost poured himself a cup of coffee. His clothes were similar to those he'd worn the day before, and I had to admit, the guy had style. His tailored suit ma was made of blue wool. He wore a matching fedora, and his, hat, his hair was freshly braided with dark blue lapis lazuli. I guess I said that. One of the stones that Egyptians often used for jewelry. Even his glasses matched. The round lenses were tinted blue. A tenor sax rested on a stand near the fire pit. And I could totally picture him playing out there, serenading the East River. As for Sadie, she was dressed in a white lemon pajama outfit like me. But somehow she'd managed to keep her combat boots. She'd probably slept with them on. She looked pretty comical with the red shirt hair and the outfit. But since I wasn't dressed any better, I couldn't make fun of her. Um, almost, I asked. You didn't have any pet birds, did you? Kafu's eating something with pink feathers. Hmm, I almost sipped his coffee. Sorry if that disturbed you. Kafu's very picky. He only eats foods that end in an O. Doritos, burritos, flamingos. I blinked. Did you say? Carter, Sadie warned. She looked a little queasy like she'd already had this conversation. Don't ask. Okay, I said, not asking. Please, Carter, help yourself. I'm most way toward a buffet table piled high with food. Then we can get started with the explanations. I didn't see any flamingo on the buffet table, which was fine by me, but there was just about everything else. I snagged some pancake with butter and syrup, some bacon, and a glass of OJ. Then I noticed movement in the corner of my eye. I glanced at the swimming pool. Something long and pale was gliding just under the surface of the water. I almost dropped my plate. Is that a crocodile? Almost confirmed. For good luck. He's albino, but please don't mention that. He's sensitive. His name is Philip of Macedonia, Sadie informed me. Wasn't sure how Sadie was taking all this so calmly, but I figured if she wasn't freaking out, I shouldn't either. It's a long name, I said. He's a long crocodile, Sadie said. Oh, and he likes bacon. To prove her point, she tossed a piece of bacon over her shoulder. 
Philip lunged out of the water and snapped up the tree. His hide was pure white and his eyes were pink. His mouth was so big he could have snapped up an entire pig. He's quite harmless to my friends, Alice assured me. In the old days, no temple would be complete without a lake full of crocodiles. They are powerful magic creatures. Right, I said. Baboon, the crocodile, any other pets I should know about? I always stopped for a moment. Visible ones? No, I think that's it. I took a seat as far from the pool as possible. Muffin circled my legs and purred. I hoped she'd have she'd had enough sense to stay away from magic crocodiles named Philip. So, almost, I said between bites of pancake. Explanations. Yes, he agreed. Where to start? Our dad, said he suggested. What happened to him? Almost took a deep breath. Julius was attempting to summon a god. Unfortunately, it worked. It's kind of hard to take almost seriously talking about summoning gods while he spread butter on a bagel. <laughs> Any god in particular, I asked casually? Or did he just order a generic god? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sadie kicked me under the table. She was scowling as if she actually believed what Amos was saying. Amos took a bite of a bagel. There are many Egyptian gods, Carter, but your dad was after one in particular. He looked at me meaningfully. Osiris, I remember. When dad was standing in front of the Rosetta Stone, he said, Osiris, come. But Osiris is a legend. He's make-believe. I wish that were true, almost. I wish that were true. Almost stared across the East River at the Manhattan skyline, gleaming in the morning sun. The ancient Egyptians were not fools, Carter. They built the pyramids. They created the first great nation-state. Their civilization lasted thousands of years. Yeah, I said, and now they're gone. Almost shook his head. A, le a legacy that powerful does not disappear. Next to the Egyptians, the Greeks and Romans were babies. Our modern nations like Great Britain and America? Blinks of an eye. The very oldest roots of civilization, at least of Western civilization, is Egypt. Look at the pyramid on the dollar bill. Look at the Washington Monument, the world's largest Egyptian obelisk. Egypt is still very much alive, and so unfortunately are her gods. Come on, I argued. I mean, even if I believe there's a real thing called magic, believing in ancient gods is totally different. You're joking, right? But as I said it, I thought about the fiery guy in the museum, the way his face had shifted between human and animal, and the statue of Thoth, how its eyes had followed me. Carter almost said, the Egyptians would not have been stupid enough to believe in imaginary gods. The beings they described in their myths are very, very real. In the old days, the priests of Egypt would call upon these gods to channel their power and perform great feats. That is the origin of what we now call magic. Like many things, magic was invented by the Egyptians. Each temple had a branch of magicians called the House of Life. Their magicians were famed throughout the ancient world. And you're an Egyptian magician? Almost nodded. So was your father. You saw it for yourself last night. I hesitated. It was hard to deny that my father had done some weird stuff at the museum. Some stuff that looked like magic. But he's an archaeologist, I said stubbornly. That's his cover story. You'll remember that he specialized in, in translating ancient spells, which are very difficult to understand, unless you work magic yourself. Our family, the Kane family, has been part of the House of Life almost since the beginning. And your mother's family is almost as ancient. The Foss? I tried to imagine Grandma and Grandpa Foss doing magic, but unless watching rugby on TV and burning cookies was magical, I couldn't see it. Oh my god. <laughs> they had not practiced magic for many generations, as Thomas admitted. Not until your mother came along. But yes, a very ancient blood bloodline. Sadie shook her head in disbelief. So now Mum was magic too. Are you joking? No jokes, Thomas promised. The two of you. You combine the blood of two ancient families, both of which have a long, complicated history Oops, there it goes. with the gods. You are the most powerful Cain children to be born in many centuries. I tried to let that sink in. At that moment, I didn't feel powerful. It felt queasy. You're telling me our parents secretly worshipped animal-headed gods, I asked. Not worshipped, almost corrected. By the end of the ancient times, the Egyptians had learned the gods were not to be worshipped. They are powerful beings from evil forces, but they are not divine in the sense one might think of a god. They are created entities like mortals, only which more, only much more powerful. 
We can respect them, fear them, use their power, or even fight them to keep them under control. Fight gods, Sadie interrupted. Constantly, I almost assured her, but we don't worship them. Thoth taught us that. I looked at Sadie for help. The old guy had to be crazy, but Sadie was looking like she believed every word. So, I said, why did Dad break the Rosetta Stone? Oh, I'm sure he didn't mean to break it, almost said. That would have horrified him. In fact, I imagine my brethren in London have repaired the damage by now. Curators will soon check their vaults and discover that the Rosetta Stone, the Rosetta Stone miraculously survived the explosion. But it was blown into a million pieces, I said. How could they repair it? I almost picked up a saucer and threw it on the stone floor. The saucer shattered instantly. That was to destroy, I almost said. I could have done it by magic. Hadi, but it's simpler just to smash it. And now, I almost held out his hand. Join. Hi, Nan. A blue hieroglyphic, hieroglyphic symbol burned into the air above his palm. The pieces of the saucer flew into his flew into his hand and reassembled like a puzzle, even the smallest bits of dust gluing themselves into place. Almost put the perfect saucer back on the table. Some trick, I managed. I tried to sound, sound calm about it, but, all, but I was thinking of all the odd things that had happened to my dad and me over the years, like those gunmen in the Cairo Hotel who'd ended up hanging by their feet from a chandelier. Was it possible my dad had made that happen with some kind of spell? I almost poured milk in the saucer and put it on the floor. Muffin came padding over. At any rate, your father would never intentionally damage a relic. Simply didn't realize how much power the Rosetta Stone could contain. You see, as Egypt fate as Egypt faded, its magic collected and concentrated into its remaining relics. Most of these, of course, are still in Egypt, but you can find some in almost every major museum. A magician can use these artifacts as focal points to work more powerful spells. I don't get it, I said. Almost spread his hands. I'm sorry, Carter. It takes years of study to understand magic, and I'm trying to explain it to you in a single morning. The important thing is, for the past six years, your father has been looking for a way to summon Osiris, and last night he thought he found the right artifact to do it. Wait, why did he want Osiris? Siddy gave me a troubled look. Carter, Osiris was the lord of the dead. Dad was talking about making things right. He was talking about mum. Suddenly, the morning seemed colder. The fire pit... The fire pit sputtered in the wind coming out the river. He wanted to bring Mom back from the dead, I asked. But that's crazy. Almost set, almost hesitated. It would have been dangerous, inadvisable, foolish, but not crazy. Your father is a powerful magician. If, in fact, that is what he was after, he might have accomplished it using the power of, the power of Osiris. I stared at Sadie. You're actually buying this? You saw the magic at the museum. The fiery bloke. Dad summoned something from the stone. Yeah, I said, thinking of my dream, but that wasn't Osiris, was it? No, almost said. Your father got more than he bargained for. He did release the spirit of Osiris. In fact, I think he successfully joined with the gods. Joined with? Almost held up his hand. Another long conversation. For now, let's just say he drew the power of Osiris into himself. But he never got the chance of, to use it because, according to what Sadie had told me, it appears that Julius released five gods from the Rosetta Stone. Five gods who were all trapped together. I glanced at Sadie. You told him everything? He's going to help us, Carter. I wasn't quite I wasn't quite ready to trust this guy, even if he was our uncle, but I decided I didn't have much of a choice. Okay, yeah, I said. The fiery guy said something like, You released all five. What did he mean? I almost sipped his coffee. The faraway look on his face reminded me of Dad. I don't want to scare you. Too late. The gods of Egypt are very dangerous. For the last 2,000 years or so, we magicians have spent most of our time finding and banishing them whenever they appear. In fact, our most important law issued by Chief Lector Iskandar in Roman times forbids unleashing the gods or using their power. Your father broke that law once before. Sadie's face paled. Does this have something to do with Mom's death? Cleopatra's needle in London? Has everything to do with that, Sadie. Your parents... Well, they thought they were doing something good. They took a terrible risk, and it cost your mother her life. Your father took the blame. He was exiled, I suppose you could say. Banished. He was forced to move around constantly because the house monitors monitored his activities. They feared he would continue his research, as indeed he did. I thought about the times Dad would look over his shoulder as he, as he copied some ancient inscriptions or wake me up at 3 or 4 in the morning and insist it was time to change hotels or warn me not to look in his work bag 
or copy certain pictures from old temple walls, as if our lives depended on it. That why you never come, came around, said he asked almost. Because Dad was banished? The house forbade me to see him. I love Julius. It hurt me to stay away from my brother and from you children, but I could not see you till last night when I simply had no choice but to try to help. Oh, Lord. Okay. Julius had been obsessed with finding Osiris for years. He had consumed with, he was consumed with grief because of what happened to your mother. When I learned that Julius was about to break the law again to try to set things right, I had to stop him. A second offense would have meant a death sentence. Unfortunately, I failed. I should have known he was too stubborn. I looked down at my plate. My food had gotten cold. Muffin leaped onto the table and rubbed against my hand. When I didn't object, she started eating my bacon. Last night at, at the museum, I said, the girl with the knife, the man with the forked beard, they were magicians too? From the House of Light? Yes, almost said, keeping an eye on your father. You're fortunate, you're fortunate they let us go. The girl wanted to kill us, I remembered, but the guy with the beard said, not yet. They don't kill unless it is absolutely necessary, almost said. They will, they, they will wait to see if you are a threat. Why would we be a threat, Sadie demanded. We're children. The summoning wasn't our idea. Almost pushed away his plate. There is a reason you were raised separately. Because the Foss took Dad to court, as a matter of factly, and Dad lost. It's much more than that, almost said. The house insisted you two be separated. Your father wanted to keep you both, even though he knew how dangerous it was. Sadie lo looked like she'd been smacked between the eyes. He did? Of course, but the house intervened and made sure your grandparents got custody of you, Sadie. If you and Carter were raised together, you could become very powerful. Perhaps you have already sent, sent changes over the past day. Thought about the surges of strength I'd been feeling and the way Sadie had suddenly seemed to know how to read ancient Egyptian. Then I thought of something even farther back. Whew. Your sixth birthday, I told Sadie. The cake, she said immediately, the memory passing between us like an electric spark. Sadie's sixth birthday, the last one we'd shared as a family. Sadie and I had a huge argument. Don't remember what it was about. I think I wanted to blow up the candles for her. We started yelling, she grabbed my shirt, and I pushed her. I remember Dad rushing towards us, trying to intervene, but before he could, Sadie's birthday cake exploded. Icing splattered the walls, our parents, the faces of Sadie's, six, Sadie's little six-year-old friends. Dad and Mom separated us. They sent me to my room. Later, they said we must, have hit, we must have hit the cake by accident as we were fighting, but I knew we hadn't. Something much weirder had made it explode as if responding to our anger. I remembered Sadie crying, and I chunk of cake on her forehead and upside down candle stuck to the ceiling with its wick still burning and an adult visitor one of my parents friends had his glasses speckled with white frosting yeah. i turned to almost that was you you were at sadie's party vanilla icing you recall very tasty but it was clear even then that you two would be difficult to raise in the same household and so i faltered what happened to us now i didn't want to admit it but i couldn't stand the thought of being separated from sadie again she wasn't much but she was all i had you must be proper. You must be trained properly. Almost said, whether the house approves or not. Why wouldn't they approve? I asked. I will explain everything. Don't worry. But we must start your lessons if we stand any chance of finding your father and putting things right. Otherwise, the entire world is in danger. If we only knew where Phoenix, I blurted out. Almost said to me, "What? Last night I had well, not a dream exactly. I felt stupid, but I told him what had happened while I was asleep. Judging from Almost's expression, the news was even worse than I thought." You're sure, he said, birthday present, he asked. Yes, but what does that mean? And a permanent host almost said, he doesn't have one yet? Well, that was what the rooster-footed guy said. That was a demon, almost said, and a, a minion of chaos. And if minions are coming through to the mortal world, we don't have much time. This is bad, very bad. If you live in Phoenix, I said. Carter, our enemy won't stop in Phoenix. If he's grown so powerful so fast, what did he say about the storm exactly? He said, I will summon the greatest storm ever known. Almost scowled. The last time he said that, he created the Sahara. A storm that could destroy North America, generating enough chaos energy to, deter, to give him almost invincible form. What are you talking about? Who is this guy? Almost waved away the question. More important right now, why didn't you sleep with the headrest? I shrugged. It was uncomfortable. More important. Wait, it was uncomfortable. You, did, you didn't use it, did you? Sadie rolled her eyes. Well, of course I did. It was obviously there for a reason. Sometimes I really hate my sister. Ow, that's my foot. Carter almost said, sleep is dangerous. It's a doorway into the duot. Lovely, said he, grumbled another strange word. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I said. The Duat is the world of spirits and magic. It exists beneath the waking world like a vast ocean with many layers and regions. We submerged us underneath its surface last night to reach New York because, because travel to the Duat is much far, faster. Carter, your, your consciousness also passed through its shallowest currents as you slept, which is how you witnessed what happened in 
Phoenix. Fortunately, you survived that experience, but the deeper you go into Duat, the more horrible things you encounter, and the more difficult it is to return. There are entire realms filled with demons, places where the gods exist, and their pure forms so powerful, their, more presence, their mere presence would burn human ashes. There are prisons that hold beings of unspeakable evil, and some chasms so deep and chaotic that not even the gods dare explore them. Now that your powers are stirring, you must not sleep without protection, or you leave yourself open to attacks from the Duat or an unintended journey through it. The headrest is enchanted to keep your consciousness anchored to my body, to your body. You mean I actually did? My mouth or tasted like my mouth tasted like metal. Could he have killed me? Almost his expression was grave. The fact that your soul can travel like that means you are progressing faster than I had thought. Faster than should be possible. The Red Lord had noticed you. The Red Lord said he asked. That's the fiery bloke. Almost rose. I must find out more. We can't simply wait for him to find you. He releases the storm on his birthday at the height of his powers. You mean you're going to Phoenix? I could barely get the words out. Almost that fiery man defeated Dad like his magic was a joke. Now he's got demons and he's getting stronger and you'll be killed. Almost gave me a dry smile like he'd already weighed the dangers and didn't need a reminder. His expression reminded me painfully of Dad's. Don't count on your uncle don't count your un uncle out so quickly, Carter. I've got some magic of my own. Besides, I must see what it is ha what is happening for myself if we're to have any chance of saving your father and stopping the Red Lord. I'll be quick and careful. Just stay here. Muffin will guard you. I blink. The cat will guard us? You can't just leave us here. What what about our training? When I return, almost promised, don't worry, the mansion is protected, just do not leave. Do not be tricked into opening the door for anyone, and whatever happens, do not go into the library. I absolutely forbid it. I'll be back by sunset. Before we could protest, almost walked calmly to the edge of the terrace and jumped. No, Sadie I screamed. We ran to the railing and looked over. Below was a hundred foot drop into the east river. There was no sign of almost. He'd simply vanished. Philip of Macedonia splashed in the pool. Muffin jumped onto the railing and insisted we pet her. We were alone in a strange mansion with a baboon, a crocodile, and a weird cat, and apparently the entire world was in danger. I looked at Sadie. What do we do now? She crossed her arms. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? We explore the library. Woo! My throat's starting to hurt. Alright, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel if you did. And, yeah, next time I'll make sure to get a drink.